Hello, everyone. It's uh, nice to have you on here. We got a good number and uh, we have a good group of speakers. And I want to welcome you, just jump right into it, to our first talk of the afternoon. And uh, like Ellen said, I'm going to moderate the first session. We're going to start off with some forest health issues in Kentucky. And we have Abe Nielsen and Alexandra Blevins with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. Abe is a section supervisor for the Division of Forestry and serves as the agency's forest health coordinator. Abe has an undergraduate degree in environmental science and a master's degree in forestry. After completing graduate school in 2012, Abe began working in Dr. Risky Kenny's forest entomology research lab at the University of Kentucky. During that time, he worked extensively with many insect issues impacting Kentucky forests. In 2015, Abe moved into the forest health specialist position with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. Now in his current role as a section supervisor, Abe helps coordinate multiple programs within the division, including the forest health program. We also have Alexandra who will be following and she is the forest health specialist in the Kentucky Division of Forestry. She received her bachelor's in fish, wildlife and conservation biology from Colorado State University where she discovered her love of insects and eventually pursued her master's in entomology. She has been with KDF since 2017, where she got her foot in the door as a seasonal field technician on the hemlock treatment crew. In her new position, she continues to work towards saving the Eastern hemlock and um, facilitates other exciting projects involving invasive plants and pests across the entire state. And again, as a quick reminder, be sure to use the Q&A that's uh, on your screen to ask any questions to the presenters and the chat if you have any programmatic questions or technology issues. And with that, Abe and Alexandra, take it away. All right, thank you, Carl, for that introduction. Um, as Carl mentioned, Alexandra and I work for the Division of Forestry. And uh, what I'm gonna do today is just provide a little bit of background about our agency um, and how we're organized. I'm gonna tie that to our forest health program, and then I will turn it over to Alexandra. Um, and she's going to talk more specifically about some of the major forest health issues that we have going on in the state. So I'll go ahead and get started. So Division of Forestry. Um, we are a, a state agency. Um, and the way that I usually like to explain it is that we do um, about anything and everything related to trees um, that, that you can think of. We, we have a program for that. So we have numerous programs um, across uh, our agency to deal with all of the, the complex issues that are going on with the forest. So I just wanted to spend a couple minutes here to highlight some of those uh, programs that we have. So hopefully you can see my laser pointer here uh, uh, to help go through some of these pictures. So this first picture here is looking at our seedling nursery. Uh, we have two seedling nurseries in our agency um, of which uh, they grow about 2 million seedlings a year that are used for a number of uh, private um, and, and public uses for reforestation efforts among other things. Uh, this picture here represents our urban forestry program, um, who deals with uh, forest issues from the urban perspective. Um, and they do a number of things that you might have heard of, such as Tree City uh, USA, and, and again, many other things. Uh, but what's represented here is the reforest of bluegrass effort, uh, reforestation effort that goes on in uh, central Kentucky. Our agency also offers a number of landowner services to woodland owners uh, through our stewardship program. Um, in which foresters can come out and help uh, develop forest management plans. Um, and a lot of that is uh, uh, based upon the goals of the landowner of what they might have for their woodlands. So uh, one such, such option could be helping to develop um, a plan to you know, harvest timber on their property. Um, in that case, we also have a utilization and marketing program in which uh, we deal with uh, timber uh, product output and the marketing uh, aspect of, of wood products. Uh, we also have a master logger program in conjunction with uh, the University of Kentucky, the Kentucky Forest Industry Association, um, in which anyone that wants to log in a state, they have to go through this master logger training uh, to do so. We also have rangers uh, in the field who complete thousands of inspections every year on timber harvesting operations um, in order to ensure that the best management practices um, are being implemented and then also to um, ensure the protection of water quality in those areas. We have uh, forest inventory crews who go around to uh, marked plots, wood, wooded plots around the state and take uh, forest measurements. Um, and in this, they are able to 
uh, and they gather all kinds of uh, tree measurements from uh, uh, species ID to size. And we take that information and we're able to look at, you know, the species composition and forest structure of our forest um, and to look and see how our forests have changed in the past and then also to help look to see what our forest might look like in the future and help with some of our management decisions. Um, as far as active management, we have 10 state forest uh, that we do manage. And in, in addition to management that goes on there, we also have um, a number of uh, recreational opportunities at those state forests. Uh, this picture here represents uh, Knob State Forest. We took that with a drone. So our agency has also jumped into um, uh, the drone program as well. So we do some of that uh, in our forest health work and then also with our uh, wildland fire. So uh, that takes us to the, our picture over here of we have uh, fire crews who are the first line um, on the ground dealing with wildland fire across the state. So these are the, the folks that are protecting the numerous communities uh, across our state who deal with uh, who are impacted by wildland fires every year during our fall and spring fire seasons. And lastly, I just want to point to uh, this picture up here that represents some of the educational work that we do. So um, as a whole, all of our programs have some sort of educational outreach component to them. And we make sure um, that, that anything that we uh, are doing, we're trying to, to get that outreach out to the public with the, the knowledge and expertise that we have. So um, the most of the work that gets accomplished in our agency is uh, thanks to our field staff. Um, and this map just represents our six field offices that we have. So within, within each field office, we have uh, foresters and rangers that are assigned to every single county. And this link here represents a, a good place that you can go visit if you want some additional contact information. And that link should pop up in the chat as well if you're interested. Uh, but to be able to tie all of this now back to forest health, um, it's, it's our foresters and our rangers who uh, serve as our eyes and our ears of the forest conditions. They know their local forests and woods better than anyone else in the state. So they're able to take uh, any changes or issues or um, uh, problems that they're seeing forest health wise and pass that information up the line to our headquarters office. And it's in our headquarters office where our formal forest health program um, is organized. So I'll just give a quick background on, on our program. Um, again, we deal with uh, insects, diseases, invasive plants, uh, weather related, really any kind of impacts that could be to forest system. Um, and this is gonna be a various scale. So we deal with um, individual tree issues at urban levels, but then we also deal with much larger scale issues such as uh, the emerald ash borer here that's pictured uh, that's killing millions of ash trees across our state. Um, our program has a, a couple uh, focus areas, one being survey and monitoring. So we do um, survey work in the sky. We do some small plane flying for uh, forest disturbances, but then we also do uh, roadside surveys and a lot of trapping efforts. We take that information that we learn and we uh, use that for technical assistance for training for both landowners um, and for pre professionals alike. And then lastly, uh, we have some treatment programs that a grant funded that we use to address some of the major forest health issues that we deal with. So uh, before I hand it off here to Alexandra, um, I just wanted to say this is certainly not a solo act. Um, it takes a lot of people to, to deal with forest health. Forest health is a very complex and complicated issue and there's many uh, groups out there that have their own for, uh, focus within the forest health world, but there's also a lot of great partnerships. So we have partners at the federal, the state level, uh, all the way down to the local and, and a any number of associations and organizations that help us out uh, with that work as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead um, and introduce Alexander, who again is our forest health specialist, and she's gonna dive a little bit deeper into uh, three of our major forest health issues. All righty, and now um, uh, thanks to Abe for that wonderful introduction to KDF. And um, a special thanks to all you guys for joining in and uh, sharing this experience with us today. And so hopefully you all can see the screen here. And let me pull up my laser pointer. All right, so as I mentioned, I'm going to focus my portion of the discussion on the forest health issues here in Kentucky. And while I could talk your all's ear off all day today about all the different and exciting programs that we have going on within the forest health, um, I'm gonna really need to hone it in. So we're going to highlight the work that we're doing surrounding the emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, and laurel wilt disease. So first up, our major culprit is the emerald ash borer. As you can see here, 
This is a beautiful jewel beetle, but it is an exotic species from Asia, and therefore it's invasive to our forests and our native trees have no natural defense system against them. And hence its name, the emerald ash borer specializes on ash species, where it feeds and develops underneath the bark of these trees and eventually exits, leaving behind this perfectly shaped D exit hole right there. And it's interesting to note that it's actually the larval form of this insect that's doing all the damage. So as you can see in this picture here, the serpentine galleries that these uh, larvae create as they feed on the sapwood of these trees, this damage will eventually girdle and kill the tree. And so all across the US, these beetles have killed millions upon millions of ash trees. And here in the state of Kentucky, it was first found in 2009. And ever since then, KDF has been doing their part to track this pest within the Commonwealth. And so you might be asking yourself, how bad is it? As you can see, the damage has been done. This graph depicts the EAB infested counties for our state and pretty much the Eastern two thirds portion highlighted here in green has been affected by this beetle spanning from its discovery in 2009 all the way to 2019. And then over here in Western Kentucky, you can see these four blue highlighted counties, and these represent the four county uh, detections that we made just this past year. And so now, what exactly is KDF's response? So as I mentioned, a large portion of our work is through monitoring and survey work on the ground or in a plane, we are surveying millions of acres every year looking for new areas of ash decline and mortality related to this little beetle. And resulting from that, those four counties that were highlighted in blue are our new detections from 2020. And those represent Davies, Henderson, Monroe, and Muhlenberg counties. So if you happen to live in one of these counties or the surrounding area, please be aware that you have a new hazard at your doorstep. And so our work doesn't stop there. We also provide the technical assistance as well as educational outreach opportunities, not only to the public, but to other agencies as well. And so, you know, I get a lot of landowner phone calls and one of the major questions that we get from folks like yourselves is, can I save my ash trees? And if so, how do I do that? Well, just a click away, we have a wonderful resource at your fingertips. If you click here, and this will be placed in the chat pod as well, you can uh, be directed to a treatment guide that will walk you through the steps of, you know, deciding whether or not you can treat your ash tree and then how to do that. So it's a great resource and you should really check it out. And now, you know, forest health, we talk a lot of doom and gloom talk, but I want everyone uh, to know there is a glimmer of hope for the future of the ash species. And this comes to us in the form of the Lingering Ash Project. So what exactly is a lingering ash? Well, I like to think of them kind of as a sole survivor in a sea of dead ash. Um, that's, uh, you know, a poetic way to put it. But, you know, in scientific terms, these are the ash trees that for some reason or another, they were able to withstand that first wave of EAB and the damage that it caused. And so we want to learn more about these trees. So we are focusing our search on northern and central Kentucky, looking for these pockets of surviving ash trees. And when we find them, we're going to record their locations and catalog them in a database that we can use for future reference. And then, you know, year after year, we're going to check up on these trees. Are they still healthy? Do they have seed? If they do have seed, we're going to collect that seed for a future seed orchard. And so Abe had mentioned, you know, we have the two, count, uh, two county nurseries within KDF, and this is where we're putting that seed when we collect it in the hope that we can start breeding genetically resistant ash trees that we can then repopulate the wild with. And, uh, you know, talking about growing trees, we're not talking about an instant gratification process here. Um, we're in it for the long haul. So, uh, Having said that, we really need your help. We need all the help we can get. So you can join the search and report. 
And uh, we're living in modern times these days. And as people say, there's an app for that. And there's an app for this as well. And it's called the Tree Snap app. So you can put this on your phone if you don't already have it. It's super easy to use. And uh, just keep in mind when you're out in your woodlands looking for these uh, lingering ash trees, um, they're gonna need to be surrounded by about a 95% dead ash in the stand. We're looking for trees that are about 10 inches in diameter or larger. And this just relates back to the age of that tree and whether or not they were able to withstand that first wave of EAB. We also wanna make sure that they're healthy trees. So we're looking for ones that have about a 50% crown health or better. All right, and moving right along, um, our second culprit, the hemlock woolly adelgid. This is another invasive insect from Asia. And you might be thinking to yourself, what is an adelgid? Well, it is something like a common garden aphid, just much, much smaller scale. So these two insects actually will use the piercing sucking mouth part to literally suck the will to live out of their host plant. And so, as you can see here, there are some highly magnified pictures um, of the hemlock woolly adelgid or HWA, I might call it sometimes. So that's under the microscope. And then these insects are so tiny that most of the time during the year, you cannot see them with the naked eye. So this little black dot here, that's the adelgid, but this is looking through a high powered lens on a camera. But we are fortunate enough uh, during the winter months these little guys will actually kind of put on a winter coat is the way I like to describe it, but they're covering themselves in this waxy white secretion and it actually makes it very easy for us to detect on the tree. And so as you can see, uh, hence the name, they are attacking our Eastern hemlocks that we have here in the state. And you can see the mass aggregation of all those adelgids feeding at the base of those needles. And this will lead to eventual defoliation and then death of our hemlocks. And so you can see these horrible looking hemlock snags out in Eastern Kentucky. And this uh, insect was first discovered here in 2006. And you know, it's been found all over the Eastern United States as well. So next, uh, you know, another uh, sad picture is painted here. You can see uh, the devastation of the hemlock woolly adelgid infestation here in Kentucky. We have found it now in 31 counties, which comprises about 98% of our native hemlock range. So unfortunate news, a hemlock woolly adelgid is here to stay, but thankfully you can see this uh, yellow circle over here. We have an isolated Western pocket of the Eastern hemlock that's in the Mammoth Cave area. And these have been untouched by HWA and we really wanna keep it that way. So how is KDF responding? Well, we actually use an integrated pest management approach. And so really all this means is that we're just using a bunch of different options to help keep this insect at bay. Alexander, so, you have five minutes. Okay, thank you. And so this first uh, step that we have here is the chemical control. And we use uh, imidacloprid as the primary insecticide that we will use in a soil drench technique. So we'll pour this around the base of the infected hemlock and it's systemic. So it'll get sucked up through the roots in the trunk up into the infected crown of the tree and the adelgid will drink this up and it's gonna kill them. And it's gonna kill them for the next five to seven years. And ever since this program started, we have treated over 195,000 hemlock trees here in the Commonwealth. And I think that's something to be really proud about. And the second facet to this integrated pest management program that we deploy are our little helpers. These are uh, a, a predatory beetle that solely feeds on HWA. So we can feel really confident that we when we release these beetles out into the wild, that they aren't gonna cause another problem for us. They're gonna do their job and eat HWA and keep the populations at bay. And so we have been releasing these little buggers for lots of years now in the hope that we can get a future field insectary that uh, we can you know, collect these beetles from in the future and release them to different locations. So if you wanna learn more about that really cool project, uh, you can follow that link there. And then lastly, to wrap it up, 
uh, our newest disease to the state of Kentucky. This is Laurel Welt disease. We just found it back in the summer of 2019. You know, our previous two topics we've been dealing with for many, many years, but this one is new and we're trying to learn as much about it as we can, as quick as we can. So what exactly is Laurel Wilt disease? Well, it's an insect disease complex. So pictured here, circled on the head of this dime, very, very tiny little insect. Also seen here on the sassafras bowl, that little black dot that's magnified to show you our culprit here, the red bay ambrosia beetle. You may have never heard of red bay, but this is just the plant that it was associated with when it was first detected here in the United States. But for the state of Kentucky, we are interested in its effect on sassafras and spice bush. So please keep that in mind. And so what does this beetle do? So it's a fungal farmer. So it carries around with it at all times fungal spores that it will actually inoculate these trees with. So as this beetle bores in and leaves behind these frass toothpicks, it will inoculate the tree with the lethal fungus. So the fungus is what's killing these trees. So as this fungus grows, you can see that dark iconic staining and that's the laurel wilt fungus. Another symptom that you can uh, look for. And then as this fungus grows, it's actually blocking off the water and nutrient flow within the tree, which leads to this rapid wilt and death that we're seeing here in our state. So you can also look for these early fall colorations. This was taken at the peak of summer. You're not supposed to be seeing those fall colors yet. So these will eventually turn a rusty brown color and just hang there. And that's gonna be a sign of a dead sassafras tree. So as I mentioned, we found this uh, just last, well, in uh, July of 2019 in Christian Todd and Logan counties here. But then just last year, we have a record setting seven new counties added to this map. So this is a fast moving disease and we need your help to track it. So when I'm out there doing these uh, road surveys, this is what I'm looking for. That uh, the wilted leaves, that rusty coloration that I mentioned before, and then those gnarly branches that stick out like a sore thumb there. And so resulting from that survey work, here are those uh, seven new counties, Trigg, Simpson, Barron, Allen, Green, Hardin, and Jefferson. If you live in these areas or surrounding these areas and are seeing the least little suspicious thing, please report it because we want to know. And yeah, one so, minute, Alexander. All right. And so not only are we doing the monitoring work to try to catch up with this disease, we're also assisting the research that's going on behind the scenes. And as soon as we learn anything, we're going to make that available to uh, the public through these uh, educational outreach opportunities as well. And then here you can see some aerial images. We weren't even sure if we could detect this from the air, but as you can see, that rusty coloration sticks out like a sore thumb. So I just wanted to mention, you know, Abe talked about drone work so we can use drones and aerial detection to add new counties to the map in the future. And then uh, the biggest news that I'm going to touch on today, we have found the first ever infected spice bush in our region. So those same symptoms that you're seeing in sassafras, you're going to see it in spice bush, the early fall coloration, the wilted leaves and fruit, the frass toothpicks, and that iconic staining from the uh, fungal pathogen that kills these trees and bushes. And so lastly, Please be a part of the solution. We need your help. I can't say it enough. Report, report, report any suspicious looking wilt um, and we'll come out and take a closer look at it for you. Um, so, you know, you've heard don't move firewood, firewood and burn it where you buy it. Um, these are major vehicle transports for these invasive insects, not only red band brooch beetle and the uh, emerald ash borer, but a myriad of other pests that we do not want here in our state. Um, there is some potential for a fung fungicide trial here in the state, but we need some more research to back that up. So, you know, that could be something on the horizon. And then lastly, we have a national treasure here in our state, the maybe even the worldwide champion sassafras tree here in Owensboro, Kentucky. If you haven't had a chance, please go and see it. And we wanna keep this thing safe and healthy um, so please do your part and uh, join the fight. It's a good fight. And with that, 
Um, I'll open it up to questions and here's my uh, contact information. You know, as Abe mentioned, it really does take a village. So, uh, you know, you have so many resources here in the state, whether it's with through KDF or the extension offices or researchers at UK, um, just reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you all so much. All right, thanks, Alexandra and, and Abe. Uh, to, if, to try to keep on time here, uh, remember to use the Q&A uh, button and type in your questions to, uh, for Abe and Alexandra and, and all the uh, presenters that will be speaking to us here in a minute. Uh, next up is, and let me do this, there we go, is uh, 